Mm -hmm. uh, and what is it you're looking for? Right. So we have just relaunched uh, the search to replace Nicole Musico, who left us at the end of last month. And so we operate in a public sector environment. We have certain processes that need to be followed. So the first step in that process is to get a headhunter who will help us once again. Uh, we will have a subcommittee of our 13 member board who will be involved in choosing the next CIO, even though the CIO reports to the CEO. And so time frame for me, you know, the best case scenario would be slightly or shortly after the first of the year to get a new person in the seat. But there are candidates. We, there are candidates reaching out now. Some of the investment strategy that Musico employed was interesting. Private mm -hmm. equity, local sports teams, Sacramento mm -hmm. Kings. How much of that continues based on what was put in place? Mm -hmm. Well, private equity has always been a part of the CalPERS DNA. And it wasn't that long ago that we did a 10-year look back at our private equity returns and really access to the markets and pacing of that capital. And what we found is we can do better. And so the asset allocation that was approved by the board in November of 2021 actually moved the private equity allocation from 8% to 13%. What you can expect to see in November is the team coming forward with a recommendation to include an additional 4 to 5 percent allocation to private equity and additional 4 percent allocation to private credit. So even though Nicole was the, certainly the lead sitting in that chair, the entire team is really around an asset allocation that delivers a 6.8 percent return. I want to go back for a moment just to the search that's taking place because if you think big picture, one of the big challenges for public pension funds seeking talent is there's a lot of political scrutiny on that person and relatively low pay compared to an endowment or private asset management uh, job. I'm curious as to what your sales pitch is to prospective candidates on why it's worth making the move to America's biggest pension fund, to, to CalPERS. Yeah, I, and I think you have to be someone who's really aligned to the mission, that we have this really important part of our world or our job that pays these benefits to 2 million public sector workers. And, you know, frankly, not everyone is really motivated to do that, whether that is a lower pay environment, whether that's the public scrutiny of sitting in the CEO seat or the CIO seat. So it takes a special combination of skill set, behaviors, alignment of interest, and really kind of that fire in the belly that you want to add purpose to your life. And now, in the past we've not had difficulty in getting candidates to be interested in those kind of that environment um, but you know the time is early and again we've had a number of candidates already reach out asking about the time of the process and then also who to contact to become a candidate so there are no conversations about the benefits of moving away from an internally managed pensions position to maybe an outsourced CIO kind of role or model there are, there are no discussions about outsourcing our CIO. I am curious, though, Marcy, uh, about the idea, sort of, I guess, of what uh, she had brought to the table. The idea, though, of diversifying in terms of the type of managers that you select, the idea of using more direct investment, and why there wasn't, uh, I guess, more of an embrace of it. Was it a rejection of the idea, or was it maybe concern about the execution? Yeah, I would say there's no rejection of any of the ideas that she brought to the table. The team fully embraced the, the concepts of additional private equity, more co-investments, looking at different platforms where we actually had the utility to implement. And of course, she had you know a wealth of background and experience before she ever came to CalPERS. And so, if there was you know any you know, thoughts about what could be done differently, it certainly was not around the uh, continued increase to private assets, whether that's private credit or private equity, and also just how to deploy those assets in a meaningful way that will pay these benefits for generations to come. So, uh, you know, uh, change management is hard, yeah. you know, for, for some, uh, but the majority of the team was really thrilled about her vision and about the strategy about how to move forward. But, but how do you get I, get, I guess, to that level, meaning making good on, on, on what you have to sort of uh, do for uh, the pensioners, making the, the pension fund whole or at least closer to whole as it can reasonably be, particularly when you talk about performance that has not only trailed the broader market, but trailed most of your pension fund peers. Yeah, we, you know, being the largest pension plan, the, the complexity of the portfolio and the size of the portfolio, there is some limiting of uh, deal flow, certainly, uh, based on the size of checks that we would have to, to write. But you're correct, we're a 71% funded plan. We certainly want to see that funded status improve over time. That can't happen without a CIO that has a vision, that knows how to work with a team, that knows how to work within the complexity of this portfolio and manage $465 billion in assets. And, 
there are not, you know, in my, you know, in my opinion, that is a very special person. Does venture capital play a role in that? It's interesting because the story of venture capital this year has been a micro focus on who you are going into business with, the other LPs, be they sovereign wealth funds mm -hmm. or otherwise. Uh, and you, you kind of talked about the limitations you have. Do those limitations apply to being able to get into growth stage venture? No, I think that uh, Anton Orlick, who is the head of our you know, private equity team, that has been part of the playbook for him, bringing in venture deals. Some of those checks can be smaller, but when you're pairing up with other funds, uh, you can write a sizable check and still expect a nice return over time. But coming back into venture, we believe is the right strategy for the portfolio. Uh, my, my New York colleagues will forgive me for keeping this local, but I want to talk a little bit about San Francisco and real estate, and actually yeah. Sacramento as well. Mm -hmm. We talk endlessly about how vacant it is or is not. But does that present an opportunity for, for CalPERS to come in and get some good deals in? for a long-term investment in commercial real estate? Well, anytime valuations are low on any asset, you know, obviously we want to take a look at it, but our, our real estate portfolio has really returned to core properties, and we do have exposure here in San Francisco. You know, the occupancy rate is much lower. We're having to do some drawdown in the book or write downs in the book on those, but um, you know, we'll watch this over time. You know, the, you know, the quarantining, the pandemic uh, really caused a, a lot of urban strife around commercial real estate, and that has not been worth through yet and so we'll continue to watch it we find opportunities we'll certainly uh, pounce on them uh, otherwise we're going to stay really to the core of what we do in real estate well I'm going to stay with Ed's lead and talk a little bit more about what's going on in California this push for CalPERS to divest from fossil fuels what kind of actions what kind of steps are you taking in response to that pressure right now we try to do you know, a lot of communication around how the portfolio is situated. Uh, we have a very strong presence and posture around engagement with companies. And those are very respectful engagements, but they're also high accountability engagements that we do have very strong expectations around transparency, around greenhouse gas emissions. We want to know that these public companies have a plan to do an energy transition. And we have a 2030 plan that we'll be presenting to the board in November that will be you know, done in closed session initially and then we'll be able to make that much more public but the plan to get to net zero by 2050 with the state of technology climate technology today that's just not possible so we have to really think about what are the interim steps we can take to start moving this portfolio reducing greenhouse gas emissions but it doesn't mean that divestment is the way to do it we really think working with these companies pushing these companies holding the companies accountable to really uh, fulfill the commitments that they're making to to the investors that's the right approach today 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 and with that approach and we know that's already been utilized, what has been the response from some of those companies? You know, the, I would say the response is mixed. You know, Climate Action 100 Plus is an engagement strategy. We have a number of companies where we have direct responsibility for that engagement, those discussions, understanding the transition plans, the business plans. And some companies, frankly, are, are doing better than, than others. Uh, so you know, we'll watch that over time. And when I say it's not divestment today, it doesn't mean that we would not underweight or overweight a company based on those engagement discussions that we're having. Uh, but that, again, will be a part of this 2030 plan and the markers associated with that, uh, you know, those are conversations we will continue to have with our board. Marcy, it's been a little while since you've been on our television screens. I realize we had a global pandemic. Yes. But, but what have you been doing, especially <laughs> since Nicole Musico mm -hmm. departed? You know, how has your role changed in that time and what does your day to day look like? Yeah, you know, the team that was in place when Nicole Musico was there is, is roughly still in place. I mean, she did do a couple of key hires. We hired our key of sustainable investments. We hired Anton Orlick, who actually has a return from um, Kaiser, but used to work at CalPERS. So my day-to-day -day is really focusing on keeping the team together, you know, the talent management, the culture management, the culture development, and really just having this team ready to go when that next CIO walks in the door and sits in that chair.